Okay, um, so good morning everyone from Cold Sutherland. Um, welcome to the weekly SAO um, Thursday Colloquium. Um, today we have Munira Hussain. Um, he's a she's PhD student um, and she's gonna talk about effect of um, cosmic wave on galaxy evolution and like other stories. Um, so I would just straight away hand it over to Munira. Uh, but before that, I would just mention you like other times, um, make sure that you post your questions if you have in between the talk um, on the chat thread, I'll, I'll read it out. Uh, and if you just want to ask questions to Munira, um, then probably wait till the end of her talk. Um, yeah, go ahead, Munira. Okay, hi everyone. Sorry, I was a little bit late. Um, today I'm going to be talking about some of my work uh, measuring the effect of the cosmic web on galaxies in the Eco Survey and some other H1 stories, some other H1 work that I'm doing. I'm a PhD student supervised by Roz Skelton uh, and Sarah Blythe at UCT. Uh, and my work on the cosmic web in Eco is done in collaboration with a few co authors. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to start talking about it. Okay, so I've probably a familiar face to a lot of a lot of people here because I've been around since about 2017. Um, I worked at the OAD for a year with uh, Vanessa and Kevin, and I did my honors research looking at galaxy mergers with Raz, and then my master's research looking um, at some cosmic web stuff also with Raz, and now I'm doing my PhD. Work. So she's kind of still uh, my supervisor because that's just how great she is. <laughs> so um, yeah, I'm also going to be talking a bit about why neutral hydrogen or H1 gas is so important in galaxy evolution. Um, and then I'm going to be focusing on my current paper and some of the results that I've found. Um, and yeah, I'll finish off by talking about my future slash current PhD work looking at cosmic neutral hydrogen in the Liduma survey. Okay, so one of the central questions in galaxy evolution is how do galaxies go from blue and star forming and lovely spiral shaped galaxies to these really large, dusty, red, elliptical, dead galaxies that don't have much star formation happening in them anymore. And one of the possible ingredients for this is neutral hydrogen gas, which is one of the fuels, raw fuels for star formation in galaxies. Uh, galaxies, if you have lots of neutral hydrogen, which is extremely abundant in the universe, galaxies are able to convert that neutral hydrogen into uh, molecular hydrogen, which they can then use for forming stars. Um, even though neutral hydrogen is quite abundant, whoops, I skipped a slide, it is extremely faint because it's a very stable atom with just one, one nucleus and one electron. So it doesn't emit much radiation except for a very specific 20 centimeter line, which is visible in the radio, in the radio part of the spectrum due to this uh, hyperfine spin flip transition, which occurs very rarely in galaxy, sorry, in hydrogen. So that's the only way we can, well, there are some other ways we can detect it, but this is one of the primary ways we can detect neutral hydrogen. Um, and because this gas is extremely faint, and I'm talking to a room full of observers, we know that when you've got something extremely faint that you want to observe, uh, what you need to do is you need to build a bigger telescope. So that's what radio astronomers are doing and have done with Meerkat and SKA. Uh, so, <coughs> One of the advantages of Meerkat is that it can detect extremely faint neutral hydrogen gas. Now this process that I've talked about where ga gas just simply becomes stars is much more complicated than that in galaxies. It's part of a larger baryon cycle where gas is recycled, uh, gas galaxies accrete gas from the environment, you have outflows happening due to bursts of star formation and there's lots of people yeah, who at SAO study this in a lot more detail and it's really, really interesting. Um, sadly, it's not that simple. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I'm just going to be focusing on the neutral hydrogen part of things mostly. Now, um, galaxy-galaxy mergers can also occur 
And we also have environmental effects like ram pressure stripping happening in galaxies. Uh, my current work on the cosmic web is looking at some of these environmental effects. So just to give a little bit of an overview of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about galaxy environments. Uh, here are two examples. You have a galaxy group where you, which consists of one, two, three, four galaxies and then foreground galaxy here that's not actually part of the group. And these galaxies sit in their own dark matter halo together and they're gravitationally bound. You can see they are interacting. There's gas and stars being uh, transferred from ga one galaxy to another due to their gravitational interactions with each other. And you have gas sitting in this dark matter halo. Then you also have galaxy clusters, which are extremely large, consist of hundreds to thousands of galaxies. Um, here's an example of it from the Hubble Frontier Fields. You can see the purple and blue shows all the hot gas that lives in this galaxy cluster. There are huge amounts of dark matter in galaxy clusters and galaxies are moving at extremely high speeds around the center of mass of the, of the cluster. And this creates uh, effects like ram pressure stripping when galaxies enter the cluster. Uh, yeah, and you can also get some tidal stripping. Uh, so yeah, you can see an example of tidal stripping happen happening between two galaxies in the stars. Uh, and here you can see some <coughs> ram pressure stripping. These are galaxies that are entering a cluster. And here you can see the contours are showing where the gas lies. So even though the um, stellar disks are relatively undisturbed at this stage, you can see the gas is starting to curve and contour from that ram pressure stripping. Okay, so the cosmic web is the large scale structure of the universe that all of these smaller uh, environments sit in. So uh, you have galaxy, whoops, you've, you've got galaxy clusters, which form kind of these nodes at the um, intersection of large filaments and walls. Then you also have these not fully empty, but more or less empty voids that exist between filaments. Um, and we see the structure in galaxy surveys and in simulations. Uh, so hydrodynamic simulations of, <coughs> of the universe formation. Um, and it's believed that the structure formed from quantum fluctuations in the early universe, which created regions of overdensity that matter was gravitationally attracted to, uh, leaving behind regions of underdensity. And over cosmic time, this grew into the structure that we see today. Um, and here you can see that even though clusters are a relatively small volume the, of, the, of, the, um, of the universe, they contain a large fraction of the mass content. And similarly, filaments are, even though they are quite tenuous and seem kind of insubstantial, they contain 40% of the mass of the universe. So that makes them a rather interesting and somewhat understudied region um, and, and environment until very recently. Um, and here you can see an example of some of the large scale structure that's been observed um, using data from the two mass survey. You can see a couple of clusters like the Virgo cluster and the Coma cluster. Uh, you can also see some of these filaments, it's a bit difficult to pick them apart in this plot, but you can see this uh, structure happening. Okay, so <clears throat> question I'm interested in is how does the structure affect the galaxies that live in it? And in the literature, one of the main trends that's been observed is that galaxies have higher stellar masses closer to the center of filaments. You can see an example here, on the x-axis, we've got the separation from the cosmic web, and on the y-axis, we've got the um, mean stellar mass, and galaxies have higher stellar masses on average, very close to filaments. Then we also have color and star formation. Here you can see an example of this showing in red that star formation is lower, close to filaments, and galaxies are redder, close to filaments. And this indicates that there might be some quenching mechanisms at play 
which cuts off star formation in filaments. Then there's this question of neutral hydrogen gas, which I've been talking a lot about. There are some simulations and observations that suggest that galaxies might be able to accrete cold gas from cosmic web filaments. For example, this result from Kleinet, or which shows in green galaxies close to filaments um, versus in red galaxies far away from filaments. And these galaxies that are close to filaments have a higher H1 gas fraction uh, for this very high mass galaxy sample compared to galaxies further away, even when they're controlled for density. But on the other hand, there have been some models and simulations and observations suggesting that gas might be stripped from galaxies. For example, there is this possibility of cosmic web stripping, similar to which is similar to the ram pressure stripping in clusters uh, of dwarf galaxies. And then there's also an additional model of cosmic web detachment where galaxies have a uh, initial su supply of, of H1 gas from the cosmic web that they then lose um, due to effects like galaxy mergers and a few other things. And there is some observations which might suggest this is happening. For example, this plot here from Trent Odecon 2018, which shows that galaxies have a higher H1 deficiency closer to filaments compared to further away. So that means that they are more H1 deficient, they have less gas. Now to look at this, I've been using data from the Resolve and Eco surveys. The Resolve survey is the resolved spectroscopy of a local volume survey. It's a volumes limited census of galaxies at low redshift. Um, <coughs> highly complete and they went in and they tried to measure to get estimates and uh, observations of H1 in galaxies. You can see the resolve survey marked here in red. And similarly, uh, as a uh, accompaniment to resolve, there is the environmental context survey or ECO, which covers a much larger volume. Uh, it wasn't as um, not as complete as Resolve because it's a much larger area, but also it has consistent um, galaxy properties and uh, H1 measurements. And for my master's thesis, I did a similar analysis to what I'm going to show in a few slides in Resolve, but uh, this paper that I'm currently working on is focused on the larger eco survey. <coughs> okay, so eco has really good H1 data. It's got all the H1 from Resolve. It's got H1 from the alfalfa survey and it's got photometric gas fraction estimates and more. Um, it also has three-dimensional galaxy positions. So that's red, RA, deck and velocity, which means we can measure the, um, which means we can measure the positions of galaxies and use that use those positions to measure the cosmic web. Sorry. And then we've also got consistent galaxy properties that are complete to a baryonic mass limit of 10 to the 9.3. And these galaxy properties have been um, in the catalogs have been prepared so that they are consistent with each other and uh, really easy to use. Then additionally, the eco team have done group binding on the survey, on both surveys, which means that we can measure the effects of galaxy groups along with the effects of filaments. So for this work, I'm using data from the third data release of ECO, and I'm going to, and trying to measure the effect of cosmic web filaments on galaxy properties. <coughs> okay, to measure the, um, to measure the cosmic web structure, I used a software called Disperse, which is the discrete persistence structures extractor. It's a commonly used topological structure identifying software for similar studies looking at the effects of filaments. And you can use disperse to extract filaments in two dimensions or in three dimensions from galaxy positions. And it works across different scales. So you could use it for a field um, that's smaller like resolve or a field that's larger like eco. It was relatively accessible to use. And once I had my uh, filaments identified, I was then able to measure the distance between galaxies and their closest filament. 
we have got some slides showing what these filaments look like in the eco field. Um, I had to do some conversions to co-moving distance, so this isn't directly RA deck and CZ anymore. Um, but here you can see galaxies are color coded by the halo, they group halo masses, and filaments are marked in black. I did the filament finding in three dimensions, but these uh, slices are just presented in 2D just to make it easier to actually see. So here you can see that the filaments trace the galaxy distribution quite well. Okay, so once I had my filaments, um, I was then able to analyze the galaxy properties with respect to the distance to filaments. And here are some of my uh, results that I'm hoping to present in a paper soon. Uh, firstly, I looked at the stellar mass of galaxies. I found <coughs> that galaxies have higher stellar masses close to filaments, which is good because that was one of the most consistent trends in the literature. Then I looked at the fraction of red galaxies close to filaments. To do this, because um, galaxy color is closely related to galaxy stellar mass, I split the sample into three stellar mass bins, a high mass sample, which is consists of mostly red galaxies, um, then an intermediate mass regime and a gas rich low mass regime. Um, and I used these criteria from this paper by Canapan at all 2013. And here I found that galaxies are redder close to filaments on average. So here you can see this red fraction increases, particularly um, in these two lower mass bins. So yeah, galaxies close to filaments are redder. Then I looked at the fraction of gas poor galaxies, since we had the H1 gas um, gas measurements. Uh, just a word of caution, I've received uh, a message from one of my collaborators saying that some of the H1 measurements that I've been using are slightly outdated. So just when, it, when I'm talking about gas results here, I just put a caution sign since these might change slightly, but I don't expect any major changes once I update the results. Um, yeah, and so what I found is that galaxies are gas poorer close to filaments. Um, and this was statistically significant for these two low and intermediate gas, sorry, intermediate mass bins. Okay, and then I also thought like, what about the group effects? As I mentioned earlier, galaxy groups uh, have their own uh, processes that affect galaxy properties. So like you saw in that image, you've got mergers happening between galaxies, gas is exchanged, sorry, gas is exchanged. And this can lead to a process, uh, to something known, known as pre-processing, which results in quenching in galaxies that live in groups. And since most of the galaxy groups seem to lie along filaments, I thought it would be important to try and separate these effects. Um, yeah, try to separate out the effects of groups from the effects of filaments purely, um, especially since there have been some studies trying to figure out if this is occurring. So to do this, I split galaxies into using the group catalogs as I split the sample into single galaxies, which just consisted of one galaxy and everything else I call the group. Um, <coughs> sorry. And the first trend again that I looked at was stellar mass. And here you can see that galaxies have, have higher stellar masses when they are in galaxy groups. But when single galaxies are still affected by the filaments and they have a significant, although small increase in the median mass close to filaments uh, compared to when you move away. I then also looked at the red fraction and here you can see quite dramatically the effect of groups um, on the color of galaxies. Uh, keep in mind that the groups seem are, um, that the groups are primarily at very low distance to filaments. So here you can see that the color in, in groups increases really strongly close to filaments um, due to those group pre-processing effects. Uh, however, we do find that galaxies are still slightly redder in this low and intermediate mass sample. 
Um, so this just shows that groups affect the red fraction more than filaments do, but filaments do still have a small effect. Then I looked at the gas fraction again, oh, sorry, the gas poor fraction again, you can see some of the effect is due to that pre-processing in groups. But for low mass galaxies, we do single galaxies, we do find that there is a slight increase in the gas poor fraction close to filaments. And that interesting, interestingly, this occurs in this gas rich regime. So um, this gas rich regime, which consists of mostly dwarf galaxies. Um, and this might suggest that some cosmic wave stripping uh, is likely since that effect was primarily found for dwarf galaxies um, close to filaments. To take it a step further, I also checked if this result still held when I uh, split the sample by halo mass as well, since halo mass can have its own effect on galaxy properties. Uh, here, you can see that for the lowest halo mass, so in, <coughs> sorry, for the lowest halo mass regime, you can see that the gas poor fraction also increases close to filaments, and these are all single galaxies as well. So this also strength, strengthens the idea that there might be some cosmic web stripping occurring. So just a quick summary of these first results. Um, we do observe that galaxies are, are higher in stellar mass close to filaments, which is in agreement with previous, previous work. Also found that galaxies are radio close to filaments for all stellar mass burns, but this strand is primarily driven by the group environment rather than filaments. And that we do find for low mass galaxies some possible cosmic wave stripping happening in them. Okay. Um, oops. Yeah, so now I want to look at, I talk a little bit about the rest of my PhD research, which is going to be focused on measuring uh, the cosmic neutral hydrogen density in the Liduma survey. Okay, so Liduma is one of the large survey projects on the Meerkat telescopes. Uh, it is an extremely deep H1 survey out to a range of 1.4, uh, and it's a Vuvuzela shaped volume in the extended Chandra deep field south. Uh, it consists of L band and UHF band observations. Uh, it's, had it, it's had its first result published um, this year, which is really exciting. And there have been some internal data releases of the first L band data. So this is quite exciting stuff happening. So, a little bit more about this cosmic neutral hydrogen density that I'm going to be looking at. It is a measure of how much neutral hydrogen gas there is in a volume of the universe. And there's been quite a lot of work trying to study its evolution with redshift. There are different techniques to do this at very low redshift, which is kind of this regime. Direct galaxy surveys have been able to measure the H1 in galaxies um, uh, directly or through stacking. <coughs> But at very high redshift, um, slightly more indirect methods have been used that study the, um, that measure the intervening H1 between that redshift and currently, so not necessarily the galaxy, so not necessarily the gas that's contained in galaxies. Um, and for example, one of these methods is the damped Lyman alpha system, measuring, whoops, measuring damped Lyman alpha systems. So this happens in this very high redshift regime. But there is a gap kind of in this intermediate redshift range that I'm hoping to address with my work since Liduma covers it quite nicely. And I'm going to be using um, this technique called spectral stacking to measure uh, the cosmic H1 density in this region. Um, and this will help me get a statistical measure of the H1 in galaxies in the Liduma field. Uh, to do stacking, which aligns the H1 signal measured from a galaxy co-adds and calculates an average. You need spectroscopic redshifts of galaxies, so very important observationally. Um, sorry, using optical observations um, to align the, the H1, that 21 centimeter line, which would get redshifted. You need, you need accurate uh, galaxy redshifts 
to make sure that that H19 is getting shifted to the right position when you add them up. Uh, yeah, so my current task is sorting through the Leduma ancillary data to get these red shifts and also to look at the general populations of galaxies which have red shifts in spectra, which have spectroscopic red shifts compared to galaxies that have been measured with photometric red shifts to kind of understand which populations of galaxies might be, um, uh, might be undersampled in the study, for example, if they are too faint to have uh, spectroscopic red shifts, I might be missing them when I'm doing my stacking. And then my next task is to start actually stacking the Duma H1 measurements. Um, and I'm going to be using the his software, which was developed by uh, a former UCT graduate, Julia, um, Julia Healy, and that's going to be really exciting. Okay. Yeah, so just an overall su summary for this colloquium. Um, yeah, understanding neutral hydrogen gas is really important for understanding galaxy evolution. And that cos uh, uh, cosmic wet filaments are an interesting environment to look at galaxy evolution properties as well. And I'm hoping to have lots of re great results coming out from my PhD. Um, this eco work I'm hoping to finish soon and submit it in the next month. Um, so yeah, please let me know if you have any questions or you can speak to me at tea time or whenever you see me around because yeah, I'm quite often at SAO <laughs> and you can usually find me in the PhD office as well. So yeah, thank you. Let me know if you have any questions. Thanks, Munira. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat yet. Um, if anybody wants to speak up, just raise your hand probably. I just... Okay, Patricia. Yes, Patricia. Uh, yeah, thanks. That was a very nice talk. This may be a rather silly question, but uh, you you mentioned RAM pressure stripping quite a, a bit early oh, yes. on in the talk. Is it simple to distinguish between gravitational effects and RAM pressure stripping? How, how, do, how is that done? Um, that is an interesting question. So... Usually you will see tidal effects happening within kind of like galaxy, smaller galaxy groups or in galaxy pairs or triple, triple, uh, yeah, triple systems. So that's where you will see kind of the tidal tails happening and that's usually gravitational. Ram pressure stripping tends to be more of like an, I don't know how else to put it, but like an outward effect. So you'll see these, like they're called jellyfish galaxies that enter, let me see if I can just get that slide. Um, yeah, so here you can see kind of this curve happening outwards. Like, so if the cluster is here, the curve is happening <laughs> that way out. So you can kind of see, it's kind of not quite in the reverse of gravitational in like an attractive, it's kind of just pushing gas away gas and stars away if that makes sense yes I I... there must be a kind of combination of these things a lot of the time but oh, okay. yeah Thanks. yeah okay Thank you. i see vanessa's also got an, a question yeah vanessa Bo go ahead uh, thanks manira for a great talk um i think I uh, had also really a, a question about um, the filaments. So yes. you know in the picture you showed, um, I think it's that, um, yeah, that one. Um, so the, in that picture, as far as I understand, like this, the position and the structure of filaments is determined by, you know, survey, so light, right? So yeah. then is it not obvious that you should see higher mass galaxies i.e more luminous galaxies closer to filaments yeah i mean that is one of the um questions <laughs> so yeah i think there all, have also been a lot of simulation work there has also been a lot of simulation work looking at this kind of thing uh from those like um yeah these like large hydrodynamic simulations and they mm -hmm. kind of find similar trends as well um yeah, but it is in also. That case, would you have? Yeah. Is, would you? Would the filament be defined more by the dark matter distribution in that case? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So those hydrodynamic simulations look 
yeah, they they constructed from the dark matter and then kind of, so they're not as biased by what you see, I think. Um, yeah, what what's more luminous. So yeah, the, it, the galaxies kind of follow the dark matter, I believe. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, okay, we have Cabello. Cabello, will you ask a question now? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, just wanted to con congratulate Munir on giving a great talk. <laughs> thank um, you. Uh, I have two questions, but I don't know how much time we have, but I'll just start with this. Um, I don't know if I missed this, but uh, at what redshift are you making your studies? Um, okay. And have you uh, looked at the dependence on redshift um, or what if there's, there's, there's a range at which your, your galaxies are observed? Yeah, are so I forgot to mention that, but the eco survey that I've been looking at and the resolve survey are at low redshift. So less, like I think it's about, it's less than 0 0.1, I believe. So uh, I might be wrong, but yeah, it's a very low, low, low redshift. Um, it's difficult to study this at higher rate shifts just because you kind of uh, start to, um, what's the word that I'm looking for? It's like, it's harder to actually get your measurements of all the galaxies. You kind of start to miss a lot of galaxies as you go out in rate shift just because of that. Um, like they become fainter and stuff like that. So it is more difficult to measure this evolution at redshift. So most of the studies that have looked at the evolution of the cosmic web, there have been a few, they've all been simulation based. So yeah, there have been some attempts to try and figure out how the structure um, has evolved, but it's difficult to do observationally. Okay. Yeah, no, I thought it would be quite interesting to actually uh see how it does if there's any redshift dependence to the to the results that you have yeah and, uh, yeah one last question at this time is just like how did you estimate the stellar masses of your galaxies oh okay so in the um eco survey i believe the stellar masses were estimated from uh they used a trying to i believe they used a um they used like the photometry to and SED modeling and they because they use data from a lot of different surveys to compile these eco and resolve uh, catalogs what they did was they used their own SED model that they created to consistently apply to all the galaxies that they measured and that's how they got the galaxy properties like stellar mass and um, and the color properties as well as a few other parameters that I didn't really use so yeah, I hope that answers it. Yeah, no, thank you so much. Okay, um, I don't see any other questions or raised hands yet. Anyone else? Um, if not, I should add that. Uh, where's the slide? Yeah, there are some papers explaining those, like SED modeling, on the Resolve website. If you wanted to. Look at them a bit more in a bit more detail. Okay. Okay. Then let's thank Munira for this wonderful talk. Um, excellent. Um, we hope you progress really well in your PhD work. <laughs> and thank you. Look at a lot of Mirka data. Yeah, I'm hoping so too. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for attending. Um, and this concludes today's session. Bye bye. Oh, I see there's one more hand up. Oh, yeah, Diana, sorry. We didn't miss you, I guess, Diana. Oh, I see he is, she is. Okay. Oh, you can, you can catch. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you, bye.